In Cambodia, in the heart of the jungle, the site of Angkor designates an entire group of monuments spread across an area of around 230 square kilometers. Here stood the capital of the Khmer Empire from the 9th to 15th centuries. The hundreds of temples and various constructions that constitute the site made it an exceptional administrative and religious center for its time. Today in Cambodia, 95% of the population is Buddhist. This religion, introduced to the Khmer territory around the 13th century, ends up seducing the sovereigns of Angkor and supplanting the earlier Hindu religion that was present. But the Khmer retained an old foundation of animism, and their world is populated by genies and spirits, both good and bad. Joined with Buddhism and Hinduism, this animism explains the mystical attitude of the Khmer, who are careful to respect the harmony of the cosmos. The majority of believers hope for a next life without pain thanks to their prayers and numerous offerings. The Cambodian people are a very spiritual people and they make the best of their obstacles while accepting their fates. Khmer art, which is characterized by representations of gods, men and animals with strong iconography, developed over a particularly long period from the 7th century until the 15th when Buddhism supplanted Hinduism. For specialists, Khmer art is some of the most refined art of Asia. Its rarity and its formal perfection serve as a reference. The site of Angkor is divided into two main zones, the well-known temple of Angkor Wat and the royal city of Angkor Thom. The royal city of Angkor Thom is shaped like a square with sides that are around three kilometers, surrounded by an eight meter high wall. In the middle of each of the four walls of the enclosure, there's a monumental gate decorated with immense faces of the four great kings of the Hindu pantheon. Each gate has a corresponding causeway that spans the moat. The one that leads to the south gate is guarded on each side by two rows of 54 giant statues, the Yaksha. To the right there are the Devas, who are the benevolent gods. And to the left, there are the Asuras, who are the demons. Originally, the gods and demons both pulled on a stone serpent, now collapsed, as a representation the churning of the sea of milk. The churning of the sea of milk, in order to extract the nectar of immortality, is the myth of the creation of the universe in the Hindu religion. Inside the walls, now invaded by the forest, the four gates are extended by perpendicular pathways that meet in the center of the site, where the Bayon is located. The Bayon not only incarnates the creative genius, but in particular, the oversized ego of the legendary king of the Khmer Empire, Jayavaram VII, who had it constructed at the end of the 12th century. The Temple Mountain is the most impressive representation of the Baroque style of Khmer art. It was built on the model of a pyramid with three floors, with a total height of 43 meters, and is a veritable maze of stairways, towers, and terraces. The structure once had 54 towers, which represented, according to legend, the 54 provinces of the Khmer Empire. The first two levels, square and decorated with bas-reliefs, lead to the third, circular level, where strange towers with mysterious appearances stand. Brahma, generally represented with four heads looking in four different directions, is the creator god who made matter and the universe. The Bayon is a square structure of around 150 meters per side, and it is also surrounded by walls and gates. 
Inside the walls, a courtyard contains galleries, 16 chapels, and two libraries. The distinctive feature comes from these galleries, which were covered originally, the walls of which are covered with fabulous bas-reliefs that unfold across more than one kilometer, with more than 11,000 characters. These bas-reliefs relate the bloody exploits of the Khmer army, from Angkor against the Cham, another rival Cambodian ethnicity. They also explain the daily life of the Khmer in the 12th century, with market, hunting and fishing scenes, as well as duels and processions. While highly detailed, these bas-reliefs are not accompanied by any kind of text, so an uncertainty lingers over even the historical events that are represented. One scene in the Southern Gallery depicts a naval battle with Cham warriors in boats and dead Khmer fighters beneath the water. Another scene in the Southern Gallery shows a military procession in a forest with elephants. Further away, a naval battle on Tonle Sap, the great lake of the country. Beneath the confrontation between the Khmer and Cham forces, there are scenes of everyday life, showing a market, outdoor cooking, and hunters and gatherers. Another scene showing a melee amongst the Khmer evokes a civil war. Opposite there, in the Northern Gallery, other scenes show still more victories of the Khmer over the Cham. It should be mentioned that the site of Angkor Thom was built just after the victory of King Jayavaram VII over the Cham armies. So it's normal that the site extols the war feats of its ruler and builder. The Cham had in fact destroyed the first religious and royal complex here, and it is on these ruins that the Khmer built the one that still exists and we can visit today. Incidentally, one wall retraces the pillage of the original royal city in 1177. After crossing the courtyard, another gallery circles the temple. It is the interior gallery. Its bas-reliefs, made later, are additions by Jayavaram VIII and are a striking contrast with those of the exterior gallery. Instead of battles and processions, there are scenes from Hindu mythology, like the Apsaras here, who are celestial dancers. Here as well, there's no certainty as to what some panels represent or what relationships they could have between each other. The interior wall is dotted with gopuras, which are sacred towers with four monumental faces on their four sides.
On the walls, frescoes line the space, telling Les Bellicos stories. Another gallery holds a series of panels that show a king with his hands being examined by women after having battled serpents barehanded. Further on, we see the king lying down and sick. These images are related to the legend of the leper king, who contracted leprosy due to the venom from a serpent he fought with. The East Gallery, the pillars of which are also decorated with Apsara, is covered with the exploits of the Angkor army against that of the Cham, their hereditary enemies. The king stands on his elephant. In a recess of this gallery, there's a lingam, which means symbol. It is a standing object, often with a phallic appearance, which is a classical representation of Shiva and of masculine energy. He's the god of destruction, who dissolves the universe in order to create a new one. Further on, a Buddha reminds us that the site transitions smoothly from Hinduism to Buddhism. Above these galleries, there's the upper terrace on which the famous face towers of the Bayon rest. It is a veritable labyrinth in which each square centimeter of stone is carved or sculpted. Here is an apsara, characterized by its sensual curves and rich trappings. It is said that they had 64 ways to awaken the senses, and that thanks to their beauty, they were able to help the gods to ward off evil beings. Today, there are vestiges of only 37 of these towers, each of which was decorated with four faces illustrating the four virtues, sympathy, compassion, loving kindness, and equanimity. In total, that makes 216 enigmatic faces that scan the horizon, as if to guard the subjects of the empire to the far reaches of their territory. The central tower rises 43 meters above ground level. It stands against a temple tower that once housed a gigantic statue of Buddha that was nearly four meters high, but was demolished under the reign of Jayavaram VIII, who was Hindu. It is time to leave the Temple of the Bayon to explore the rest of the site of Angkor Thom. Aside from the four gates facing in the four cardinal directions, there's a fifth gate, the Victory Gate, which leads to the Royal Palace. The square is topped with two richly decorated terraces, which are the access to the Royal City. On the left, to the north, there's the Terrace of the Leper King. and the main one, the Terrace of the Elephants. From this terrace, the king could salute and honor the armies returning from their campaigns. The Terrace of the Elephants spans over 300 meters in length, and its height, depending on the section, is between three and five meters. These strongly carved high-relief elephants that decorate the stairs gave it its current name. Numerous harnessed and mounted elephants form the bas-relief hunting scenes that decorate a great length.
A large platform accentuated with lions is where the king stood. There is also a balustrade in the form of a naga, the giant serpent, which is supported by 54 gods and 54 demons, symbolizing the churning of the sea of milk. To the left, the terrace of the leper king, a symbol of death, was once dedicated to cremations. On this terrace, the god Yama decided who would go to heaven or hell. Shaped like a U, a wall runs along it, which is covered with the most beautiful bas-reliefs and Khmer art, representing the Hindu pantheon. Hinduism descends from the Vedic religion, which was the religion of the Aryan invaders who came from the north in the second millennium BC. Its source lies in the four Vedas, which are sacred books whose name means knowledge. Then these texts were completed by two great epic poems, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, which recounted the exploits of the deities. The Hindu pantheon is very vast. Hinduism is called the religion with 33 million gods. But all these gods are reunited in the three main gods, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, who are the three aspects of divine power, creation, preservation, and destruction. And their qualities are complemented by those of the multitude of gods in the Hindu pantheon. The two terraces were created by Jayavaram VII at the end of the 12th century. They marked the entrance to grounds of the royal palace, which was the residence of many monarchs starting from the 10th century. You enter through a small building that lets you go through the wall that surrounds it. Virtually nothing remains of the royal palace except for this temple, which was constructed before the city itself. It is the temple of Phimianakas, the celestial chariot, and its stairs, which are still in good condition, are bordered by magnificent lions. This temple was the abode of the king, where it is said he would meet with a patron goddess who abandoned her serpent body at night for that of a beautiful young woman. Most of the decorations have been destroyed or stolen, but the temple still offers one of the most beautiful views of the site. Further away, still on the grounds of the royal palace, the Bafuan, called the Golden Mountain, was built around 1060 to the glory of Shiva. It stood on the summit of an artificial hill, but had practically disappeared beneath the vegetation before being cleared and consolidated in many stages by the French school of the Far East during the 20th century. This immense mountain temple is a five-level period with 150 meter sides and consists of 300,000 sandstone blocks weighing 500 kilograms each, each of them sculpted and unique. Very damaged, its levels have galleries that overlook the jungle. In the 15th century, the temple underwent major changes to its structure in order to build a gigantic reclining Buddha on the second level of the rear face. On the site, excavations still make it possible to uncover new structures which had been plundered for their stones over the course of the ages when the site was abandoned.
But now it is time to leave Angkor Thom for the other major site of the region, Angkor Wat. Angkor Wat, temple city in Khmer, is the largest temple of Angkor, and without any doubt, it's most majestic. Its silhouette even features on the flag of the country. Built in the 12th century, Angkor Wat was originally a Hindu religious center, entirely dedicated to Vishnu, the protector of the universe. Its enclosure represents the mountain range in which Mount Meru lies, which is the center of the universe for the Hindus, and its moat illustrates the ocean, while also having a defensive role. The beauty and the size of the temple are such that some people consider it the eighth wonder of the world. And since 1992, Angkor Wat has been listed as a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. The entrance is protected by the mythical serpent Naga with many heads, a symbol of the spirit of the water. After going through the gate, an avenue that is also decorated with Nagas and is 350 meters long leads through a park to the second wall. On either side of this pathway, there are two structures whose purpose is not known, but are currently called libraries. Angkor Wat was built by Suryavaram II in the beginning of the 12th century as a state temple and capital. The temple combines two bases of Khmer architecture, the Temple Mountain, designed to represent Mount Meru, the home of the gods in Hindu mythology, and the Gallery Temple. The walls of the temple's three galleries are decorated with bas-reliefs carved along a length of several hundred meters. These archaeological masterpieces show scenes from the two major texts of Hindu culture, the Ramayana and the war epic, the Mahabharata. Here is a scene of the battle of Kurukshetra, which lasted 18 days and brought into opposition the brotherly Kaurava and Pandava clans in a dynastic struggle for control of the Aryan lands north of the Ganges River. The Pandavas, who are demigods, are victorious and take power, but over the course of the battle, numerous dilemmas arise where ties of kinship, friendship, and loyalty that had been previously made between the combatants of the two clans come into conflict. Another 800-meter-long gallery contains the exploits of the site's founder, Suryavaram II. On one of them, we follow a procession of soldiers with officers and horses. There is a review of all the weapons, swords, spears, and bows and arrows, as well as all the costumes. The generals are on elephants driven by mahouts with their hooks. This fresco, called the Sacred Fire, is dominated by King Suryavaram II. He is seated on his throne beneath 14 parasols, 17 fans, and four fly chasers, which indicate his rank. Further on, the fresco of heaven and hell depicts hell below, earth in the middle, and heaven above. On the two upper panels, you can see characters transported on palanquins. It is the Khmer High Society heading towards the god Yama to face their judgment. And below, the executioners of hell devote themselves to the worst punishments.
In another gallery, the famous legend of the churning of the sea of milk is represented across 49 meters. The churning of the sea of milk is the creation myth, which originated in India, but was taken up by the Khmer culture. In their joint action, the gods and demons churn the sea of milk for 1,000 years to create a drink of immortality. To do this, they use a serpent wrapped like a cord around Mount Mandera. This allows them to turn the mountain in a back and forth motion, thanks to the action of the gods and demons who take turns pulling the body of the serpent. The god Vishnu is in the center of the scene and holds the serpent who is used to churn the sea of milk. In reality, he is represented twice, in his traditional form and in the form of one of his avatars, the turtle Kurma, on which the mountain rests, but it is not really visible as the scene appears unfinished. This churning also gives birth to marvelous creatures like the moon and the sun. Continuing to follow the gallery that surrounds the central temple, you discover a bas-relief that narrates the battle between the gods and demons, where many legendary characters appear. This panel, that is around 95 meters long, once again tells of the legendary battle of the devas against asuras, which could represent the eternal combat between good and evil. This great cosmic battle includes no less than 20 leading deities, who arrive from the left of the panel, each riding their animal vehicle. All the encounters take place among a jumble of warriors who, with their often disordered attitudes, provide some dynamism to the paddle. On the other side of the gallery, on a 50-meter-long panel, is the victory of Vishnu over the Asura. The god is, among other things, depicted on his mount, the bird Garuda, and he successfully confronts the many Asura who assail him from every direction. On another bas-relief, 67 meters long, is the victory of Krishna over Asura Bana, the god with a thousand arms. The god Vishnu is manifested here with the traits of Krishna, who is one of his many avatars. Once the tour of the galleries is finished, it's time to go inside the walls of the temple itself. After the gate, a cross-shaped gallery with pulls served as an antechamber for the temple. This gallery is nicknamed the Gallery of a Thousand Buddhas because the Khmer had the custom of leaving statues of Buddha here as offerings. But most of them were destroyed during the Civil War. Once the gallery and the pools have been crossed, we arrive at the central temple. The central temple and its famous towers that are 55 meters high consists of three levels encircled by a maze of galleries arranged around a courtyard. This courtyard could originally be flooded. 
in order to represent the ocean surrounding the mythical Mount Meru. Here as well, each angle is topped by a gopura. You reach the second level by going through a portico in another rectangular enclosure. There's a cobblestone surface there where there are two more libraries. All around the central sanctuary, there are finely made galleries with twisted bars and apsaras. The sanctuary was originally dedicated to the Hindu god Vishnu, but in the 15th century, the temple, like the rest of the country, was redirected from Hinduism by the worship of Buddha. And today, there are statues of the new god. From this esplanade, you reach the central sanctuary via 12 very steep stairways that represent the difficulty of reaching the kingdom of the gods. At the top of these stairs, there's a platform surrounded by galleries with four towers, one on each corner, the fifth being in the central position. Lintels and sculpted pediments ornament the entrances of the galleries and the tower shrines. The four towers are connected by the galleries. Inside, other galleries divide the space into four sections by cutting the space at right angles. At the junction of the four central galleries, the square base of the main tower contains a small shrine on each face, behind which there's the sacred core. Contrary to most of Angkor's temples, Angkor Wat is oriented towards the west, probably because it is oriented towards Vishnu. Originally Hindu and then Buddhist, it is the most well-preserved temple of the site, and it is the only one to have remained an important religious center since its founding. On the site of Angkor, the Taprom Temple is without a doubt one of the most fascinating ruins of the site. Taprom means Ancestor Brahma. Taprom was once a monastery around which there stood an immense opulent city. Dignitaries dined there from gold dishes, slept in silk sheets, and the central tower was decorated with precious stones. After the fall of the Khmer Empire in the 15th century, the monastery was abandoned and forgotten for hundreds of years. One of the main attractions of the site is, in fact, that it was abandoned to the jungle. In the shade of gigantic ficus and silk cotton trees, the towers and walls of the temple only remain standing anymore thanks to their interlaced roots. If the temple had to be restored, cutting the trees that invade the ruins would probably lead to the collapse of a large part of the site. Which is why, in the beginning of the 20th century, the archaeologists of the French School of the Far East took the side of leaving it as they had found it. The idea was also to show visitors how the city had been rediscovered by explorers a century earlier. Major works were nevertheless put in place in order to make it possible to visit the site and to control the growth of the trees.
The site is truly an image of past splendor, or it could be a symbol of the vacuity of civilizations. On the site of Angkor, the Preah Khan is a Buddhist temple that was built in the 12th century by King Jayavaram VII, the same one who had the royal city built. In Khmer, the name means Holy Sword, as it had been built in order of the victory over the Cham. Here as well, each of the entrances pointing in the four cardinal directions has a pathway that goes over the moat and is decorated with statues of gods and demons carrying the giant serpent, the Naga. This site served as a temporary royal city during the construction of Angkor Thom, and its monastery was not finished until after Jayavaram VII had moved to his new palace. The enclosure contains many ancillary structures, including a hall of dancers, ponds, libraries, and cloisters, all interconnected by galleries that you pass through to reach the enclosure of the sanctuary. The sanctuary is surrounded by a wall that is 210 by 160 meters, with large entrance pavilions at each of the four cardinal points. The central sanctuary is also a dense interlacing of galleries and halls, with columns where, here too, nature has reasserted itself. The temple had been dedicated to the father of the Builder King, and here and there, in the ruins, you stumble upon magnificent remains like lintels with apsaras. Here's a stupa at the center of four light openings. And there, a lingam, the symbol of Shiva, on which milk and honey are poured. Going towards the heart of the sanctuary, we reach the central tower, which now contains a small statue, the original having been looted. Prasat Bhante Kade was built during the same era and in the same style as Ta Prom and Pre Khan, but it is smaller and less complex. Furthermore, it is in quite bad shape due to construction defects and the low quality sandstone used in its buildings. The Khmer Empire lasted six centuries from 802 to 1431 originally with Hindu religious beliefs and later within the framework of Buddhist religious practices. In the 12th and 13th centuries, there was a crescendo of fervor and many Buddhist temples like this one were built. While Jayavaram VII was personally credited with many of the constructions around the site of Angkor, he was also accused of wasting money to the detriment of the country society. But in the 13th century, after his death, most of the temples that he had had built were vandalized, and their statues were looted, as here. And after that, they were lost in the vegetation until the 20th century.
located to the east of Angkor Thom, north of the road that leads to the Victory Gate, the Thomanon is a Hindu temple built in the 12th century. It consists of a single enclosure surrounded by a ditch moat, containing two gopuras, libraries, and a tower shrine. It has bas-relief and high-relief decorations of remarkable quality, where the Ramayana occupies an important place. The Ramayana, along with the Mahabharata, is one of the fundamental texts of Hinduism, composed between the 3rd century BC and the 3rd century AD. Made up of 24,000 verses, the Ramayana recounts the birth and education of Prince Rama, who is the seventh avatar of the god Vishnu. The Ramayana contains many tales, but it is not exclusively religious. It also contains legendary, mythical, or cosmic tales, like the creation of the earth, for example. On the other side of the road that leads from the city of Angkor Thom to the Victory Gate, the Chao Sai Tavoda is from the same era as the Tamanan. This temple mountain was also encircled by a single wall, surrounded by a ditch moat, and it has four gopuras in the four cardinal directions, libraries and a tower shrine. Here too, the bas-relief and high-relief decorations are of remarkable quality and foreshadow the style of Angkor Wat. Nayak Pin, or Entwined Nagas, is a small, very original Buddhist temple that was also built by Jayavaram VII in the middle of the water. The main pond on which the holy site is built is itself surrounded by four smaller ponds. In the center of the large pond, there's a circular island on which the 14-meter-high central prasat is built, surrounded by two nagas with their tails entwined, which gave the temple its name. Richly decorated chapels form entrances that make it possible for water to move between the different ponds. This temple was a center of purification. The Ta Sum, Ancestor Sum, is another small Buddhist temple that was also built by Jayavaram VII. Built in the style of the Bayan, it includes two walls surrounding the temple itself. Here, too, the stonework is remarkable in its precision and the elegance of its curves. The site of Angkor contains other sacred sites, including that of the Citadel of Women, Bante Sre, which is entirely dedicated to Shiva, who represents destruction, transformation, and the future. Circled by an exterior moat, it was built in the 10th century using a pink sandstone that takes on different tints depending on the position of the sun. Unlike the temple mountains, Bante Sre is a flat temple that has three enclosures. It is in quite good condition and has sculptures of exceptional finesse.
Despite its relatively modest size, you can spend hours looking at its statues, its carved facades, and its door lintels depicting Khmer mythology. It's virtually goldsmithery with stone. The French school of the Far East carried out its first major restoration at Bantai Sre in 1930, and the complete success of this undertaking made it possible to open the path for many other sites across all of Angkor. The sculptures and statues are taken from Indian mythology, with many representations of scenes from the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. The multiple gopuras of the three enclosures, the finesse of the sculptures of the pediment scenes, especially those of the North and the South libraries, the beautiful color of its pink sandstone, and the exceptional quality of its decorations and sculptures make it clear that the temple is a jewel of Khmer art. Today, it is considered one of the most beautiful sights of the East. At Angkor, before all of these wonders, we can only quote one of the first Western visitors, a Portuguese monk who came to the site in 1586 and declared, these temples are of such extraordinary construction that it is not possible to describe them on paper, even more so because they are not like the other buildings in the world. There are towers, decorations, and all the refinements that human genius can conceive. In addition, this region of Angkor remains very focused on religion and the mystical. Because, despite the state of neglect of the site in the 15th century and the influx of tourists, the temple of Angkor Wat remains an important site of pilgrimage. <laughs>